This next person, he's probably the biggest influencer in the space, at least on YouTube. Probably on TikTok as well, his TikTok videos are sick. Who here is interested in rental arbitrage? Who here is interested in absolute financial freedom? Who's here interested in RVing across the country? This dude literally just got back from doing that. So I am super pumped to welcome to the stage the founder, I know we just rebranded, so you're gonna have to tell me what the new name is, but the founder of Airbnb Automated, Mr. Sean Rakici. Give it up, everybody up, get up. Thank you, Bill, um, for putting this together. Thank you, Mike, this is awesome. And to all of you who put in the time to be here, this couple of days, I really feel like it's super important. I feel like there's been a lot of value exchanged already. And I hope to also be one of the people that gives you some value. Interestingly enough, I think I might be the most unique voice here because I'm not in real estate. Everybody else that you're gonna to talk to today, yesterday, the day before, they are real estate professionals. They can tell you all about what to do in real estate. And I don't own a single dollar of real estate. And I've been in this space about seven years, been teaching for five. And I actually got into this by accident. I kind of like stumbled into it. And I don't want to give you a big long backstory about who I am because I don't think that's important to teach you. And I really only have like 45 minutes to teach you guys arbitrage really, really fast. So I'm gonna to try to keep it to a minimum. But my first million dollar business was in the newspaper industry, of all things. I was 24 years old, owned this little sales company that sold newspaper subscriptions at grocery stores. Some of you might even see them. You walk into a Kroger or an HEB, and some person's like trying to stop you to buy a newspaper. That was my company. So, long story short, I end up getting so big that I'm trying to recruit the best in sales from across the country. And in order to recruit the best in sales, I needed to convince them to move to new cities like Houston, which is where I was living at the time. So I started renting apartments and furnishing them and saying, hey, come to Houston, I'll give you a place to stay. You can stay for free. It was really this like subtle corporate housing strategy to relocate sales superstars to Houston. So this was 2014. I had about three apartments in this high rise called Sky House in Houston. If any of you are from Houston, you know the building or the buildings now that I think there's three of them there. So all of a sudden, just timing, people moved out. Somebody moved back home, somebody broke up with their girlfriend, sales guys have drama, so they moved. And I, with all of my optimism and none of my planning, by the way, had three apartments fully furnished that had 10 months of lease left, and I was just gonna pay the rent. I was like, that wasn't smart. Um, so that leads me to Airbnb. I sat on those, those apartments for three months. They just paying the rent like zero dollars of income on these apartments until one day I'm hanging out with my friends and a friend's like, yeah, I just stayed at an Airbnb in Austin. It was super cool. I'm like, what does Airbnb do exactly? Can you explain? And so lo and behold, I just took some photos really quick, put those on Airbnb and my very first month on, month on the platform was probably November 2014. Um, we made like $12,000 on three apartments, right? I was like, what, what is this? But I am, my deepest regret in life, if I have one, is that I didn't take that as the sign to start building this business. That was end of 2014. I sat on those apartments for the rest of the year. They made like net income, maybe $2,000 per door, and their rents were all under 2,000 a piece. So the margins were really good, but I was still building this newspaper business. I thought my newspaper thing was actually going to be the future, which again is poor planning, right? Newspapers. Oops. But, Luckily for me, the Houston had, uh, Houston had a Super Bowl 2017, and I started seeing the news about people who were going to rent their places out for a thousand a night, right? I'm like, a thousand a night? I need to get my, like, more apartments. I need to pick up some more. So I blitzed to having 10 apartments, and I made like $15,000 net income on Super Bowl Sunday just for that day, because my ADR was so high, which was super awesome. And that's what finally convinced me to enter the space. But the point here is, is none of that was real estate at all. I owned a sales organization. I wanted to reduce the cost of housing my sales guys instead of using a hotel. I got my own apartments and it was a synergy for relocating employees. And that was really what I was using it for. So then scaling because of Super Bowl, that was all hotel, that was all hospitality. And that's why um, I had a friend make this little mural to keep me on track because I don't actually plan my speeches. But the caterpillar butterfly metaphor is that we are really truly transferring a product that could be sold in the real estate market or utilizing real estate. We're transforming that piece of real estate into hospitality. 
it is, once it's on Airbnb, it is literally no longer real estate. And this is a controversial take for many of my real estate friends. If you look at it this way, um, you actually don't know about my business yet, but I have 120 doors on Airbnb, right? I own none of them. I've never owned a dollar of real estate except for a bus I just bought, like he said. I bought a bus, I'm converting it to an Airbnb and I'm driving it around. But um, aside from that, the last seven years, I haven't, I haven't read a real estate book. I haven't taken a real estate course. I haven't thought real estate thoughts. I just keep leasing. In my world, I see the short-term rental space in arbitrage as sales and hospitality. And I really want to kind of hopefully use my belief system to break maybe some of those limiting beliefs that you guys have about arbitrage because it is super powerful. So once Airbnb gets, like once your real estate gets into the Airbnb space, it's all about the customer, right? It's all about the turnover, it's about efficiencies, it's about your housekeeping team, all these systems that are in place. I, I can't see a bit of real estate in that logic. And I built this 120 doors up with all leases to now I work zero hours a week, which I think was the point that he was getting to. There's a woman named Haley that runs my company. Uh, she lives in Dallas, and I hired her three years ago as my assistant. We were cleaning apartments together. Like, we were scrubbing toilets on her first day. It was really fun. And she has since grown to be leading a $4.2 million per year company with a 28% EBITDA. So we're doing really, really well for owning zero dollars real estate. And unlike Julie, I'm not gonna sell. I guess I'm a little too greedy to sell it. I'm just gonna sit on it and let it cash flow for a while. Um, eventually, Haley will get a percentage equity of the company as the CEO, but um, the only time I think our company may ever buy real estate is if we want to take advantage of the, the, the depreciation advantages like the really smart guy Ryan said yesterday. I think he really opened up my eyes to some stuff. So we are open-minded to buying one day, but not because we wanna do real estate, but it might be our last Alamo for a discount, like on, on our taxes. So the power of arbitrage isn't even in the real estate, which is what I'm trying to say. It's in your ability to create systems and create multiplicity with those systems, create cost reductions, uh, diversify your customer base. Um, there's all sorts of different advantages that come with arbitrage that are really hard to achieve when you're buying properties or doing co-hosting. Naturally, when you're buying properties or doing co-hosting, you're doing a lot of like single family homes, maybe some duplexes, some, some of you out here are actually buying multifamily, which then will start to argue with my point. But for most of you, you have houses, right? Either townhomes, duplexes, single family homes. Now those are two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom houses. And the time it takes to turn that house over is a long time, right? You might have two housekeepers cleaning for four hours to clean one house. It's really hard to hire employees to clean only one or two days a week, isn't it? If you have 10 houses on Airbnb or VRBO, Verbo, I said they called me and said, please call us Verbo. Um, <clears throat> if you have 10 properties in the short-term rental space, you might know that Sundays are probably one of your heaviest days. They are for me in all of my cities. I'm in 10 cities, and Sunday is the busiest day in any of our cities. Well, if you have 10 homes that need cleaning, you'll need about 20 housekeepers, right? You might have some mid-state, mid like midweek checkouts, like some Tuesdays, Wednesdays, some Thursdays, but really, really light stuff. So if you're going to scale a business, you need to find a way to get volume on a daily basis if you're gonna hire 20 people. Now, a lot of you aren't even thinking that way yet, and that's the whole point of, like, I think my talk, is if you started utilizing arbitrage to pick up studio apartments, one-bedroom apartments, you tap in not only to a new customer base, like more business travel, more individual travelers, but you can give consistent enough housekeeping work that you can start to hire your own housekeepers. You won't be relying on third-party housekeeping companies anymore. We, we very simply, we don't even do anything special to hire our housekeepers. We have a Facebook ad we post on Facebook because we got our Facebook business page. We have an ad, so like clean for a short-term rental company, $12 per hour, $12 per hour. In all of our cities except for Dallas, we're up to 14 because of inflation, the great resignation. We're still hiring our housekeepers for under $15 per hour. And because their turnovers are, are so quick with studios and one bedrooms, one housekeeper who starts at 10.30 in the morning can clean three or four apartments by 4 p.m. And they're cleaning Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We give them days off when they want days off. We manage them just like a company, which is, of course, my backstory. I, I built a business, left the newspaper industry, built another business. And I can tell you that in hospitality, your housekeeping team is probably the most important piece of the machine. Who here agrees? Right? If your housekeepers do a terrible job, you give people refunds. Right? If your housekeepers do a terrible job, furniture doesn't get reported as broken or stained, and the place slowly degrades till you need to do a full remodel. 
stuff like that. If you have a highly engaged housekeeping team, you can build almost to infinity. Because good housekeepers, they refer you other good housekeepers, right? Engaged housekeepers, like, I've got a friend that'll work here too. And so the power of my 120 door empire has really been able to, it's my ability to give somebody a full time job as a housekeeper and like protect them, give them a really good life, and then grow with that team. We have housekeepers that have worked for us for three years now. They've never left. And that's largely Haley, because Haley's a great leader. And if I could convince them to bring her up on the next conference, you might get to hear her speak too. She's really growing as a leader, which is awesome. So long story short, you hire housekeepers by the hour full time. And by doing that, you greatly reduce your, your internal operating costs, where a $350 housekeeping might only cost you 100 now. And all that extra cash allows you to do so much stuff in your space. So by having a small batch of apartments that you arbitrage, now your houses are seeing a cost reduction because you own your housekeeper's time, you're not paying a third party, right? So what this will do for you, one plus one equals four, is essentially this is giving you synergies. And synergies in your business are where you make more money than your competitors because you found a way that like, when you put value together, you just make more money. And by having your own housekeepers, which is one of the biggest parts of arbitrage, you can now be more aggressive in your pricing strategy. Some of you have dates that you walk away on because you cannot afford to sell the space and do the cleaning. I've talked to a few of you, like yesterday and the day before, who one of your biggest apprehensions about dynamic pricing is that you just don't have enough room to move because house housekeeping is so expensive. So this not only allows you to in, like, reduce your internal costs so that every single day of the year you're making more money, but if the going got tough in your, if, in, in your market, let's say there's another slowdown, I think a lot of people are suffering a, a little bit of slowdown, more bigger houses than apartments, because my portfolio, we haven't really seen it, but I've been hearing about a slowdown like in Gatlinburg and other places. It's at that moment in time that if you have hourly housekeepers, you can adjust your rates. You're the one that gets booked and everybody else goes like, they get ghosted because they are too expensive. And in an inflationary market like this, people still wanna travel if they can afford it. And you can still make travel affordable because your cost reduction on housekeepers allows you the same margin for $200 less on a stay, which can be a really big deal. So um, a little about me, I've actually made $10 million in Airbnb to date, just the Airbnb platform. And I don't pay enough attention to tell you how much money I've made on Verbo or through direct book bookings. Um, I haven't actually worked in my business for about a year. Um, and that is a stark difference from where I came from. Before I got started with my first successful business, I was actually homeless, living in a van, bottom corner. And I think that was the most crucial part of my life. Um, I, I had a hard childhood and everything, everybody has a hard childhood. And then I got into sales, made a bunch of money. And I made like over six figures as a salesperson and I think it was that moment in time that I needed someone to spank me and be like, bro, come back. Like, get your ego in check, come back. And so I got into sales management and failed. And then I ultimately went homeless. And it was that success and then homelessness that I think prepared me for the rest of what life wanted from me, which I'm so happy that I actually had to go through that. And I wouldn't wish that on everybody, but the same mechanism of, like they said it yesterday, having your back against the wall, right? If you have tasted something so sweet, and then had it like ripped from you, you're gonna want it back. And so I was willing to do kind of whatever it takes to become successful again. So that's when I started my own business and, and moved on. I dropped out of music school before that, so I didn't actually have any business experience, no real estate experience. I was an emo kid, like emo swoop guitar, like in a band, right? And I dropped out of school because I got a thousand dollar commission check one day. I'm like, I'll never make this much money in music. I'm gonna drop out of school and go into sales. And so, it was a series of really weird decisions that led me to homelessness, to building my first business, to getting to Airbnb, and then now teaching it, right? I only started teaching on YouTube five years ago because my best friend's a real estate agent was arguing about investing strategies, whether you want cash flow or debt pay down. And I'm sitting here with 10 properties that are making like $25,000 net per month. And I'm like, I don't own anything. This doesn't make any sense. So I made a YouTube video pretty much like clapping back at him and that went viral. And if it wasn't for that viral video, I wouldn't have started growing that channel. And by not growing that channel, I would not have grown this portfolio because I didn't see this as a big opportunity because of course, I'm a guy without a plan. And you can tell, I don't actually write my, my scripts for anything, videos or otherwise. So it was because of YouTube that I started to grow to 100 doors. And between 2017 and New Year's Eve 20, 2019, so it's like, that was like just under two years. In just under two years, I went from 10 to 103. 
That's how fast you can grow with arbitrage. And I think this, I owe you the secret of arbitrage, right? You paid to be here, so I owe you the secret. Who here owns property that they've had long-term rentals? A lot of you, right? Who here has ever given a move-in special to a tenant? Wow, a lot of you guys are holding the line. Good job. Who here owns multifamily, like big ones? Cool. Your guys, you guys will see move-in specials a lot more frequently than a single-family homeowner will because sometimes a software will say, you have too little occupancy, you should get four weeks of rent for free, right? And this, this is called a lease concession or a move-in special. The way that I was able to go from 10 doors to 100 doors in less than two years with no debt, no partners, no investment, no nothing, was I convinced multifamily buildings to give me two months or three months of rent for free on the front end of all my leases. Right? So your cost to launch a door was literally the cost of furniture, the application, your security deposit, and maybe first month's rent. Sometimes they could get first month's rent from me. So the startup cost for a one-bedroom apartment was $5,000. And that was mostly furniture. And what's really cool about this is if you spend $5,000 on a door staging it, and then you get the next two months of rent for free, and you're printing cash in the hospitality industry, you might make $8,000 or $7,000 or something like that inside of that two months. Your, your rent say $1,500 or $2,000. Now you have $5,000 of cash left going into month three with your rent paid on the third month. You've already made all of your money back in like less than 10 weeks. So if you could sign five leases, like stage them inside of two weeks because furnishing one bedroom apartments is a much lower bar than furnishing a four bedroom luxury home. If you could furnish five apartments in under two weeks, get them launched three months, two months of rent for free, and get your money back within three months, you can wash that same $25,000 over and over and over again. You don't need a lot of capital in arbitrage. And if you negotiate well, you get your cash back really fast. And that's how you can rapidly scale. In my experience, what causes people to stop growing in arbitrage isn't that they run out of deals. It's that they've reached the capacity of their own leadership because businesses are about people. And at the point that you get to say 50 or 100 doors, it might be hard for you to manage housekeepers, VAs, like assistant managers, maintenance people. That's where the inertia comes in in this business model is the people, not the doors. At that point, you could probably start buying properties because you're like, I can't grow past 50. I just don't have the ability to manage that many people. And then you, just, you can turn your model from arbitrage to equity and just start building equity in that same business by buying up new properties instead of renting them. Um, now, in order to succeed on Airbnb, I think a lot of people, um, the questions that I've gotten the last few days have actually been like, really like, apprehensive. There's a lot of fear in arbitrage. Um, and a lot of that is around whether or not a landlord would even allow this. Right? In popular cities, a lot of people would say, well, landlords would just tell me if, if I wanted it on Airbnb, I'd put it on there myself. Right? Co-hosts, you've heard this, right? People are like, I'll just do it myself. And, you're, and you go, Please, have at it, go for it. Get on there, put your listing up, pay for, the, pay for the photos, pay for furniture, give it two months and call me, right? And what's really funny is they come back and go, this is way more work than I ever thought it was, can I now rent you the property? Or can you co-host my property? Ha it happens frequently enough that we all can kind of laugh about it. So that is not the, that's not the only objection I think people are worried about. So if you're going to arbitrage, let me arm you with some facts that can help you get like free rent and stuff like that. And like TJ said yesterday, know that you're the prize, right? He feels bad for landlords that don't work with him because in a way it's true. What we do is we first try to get a landlord sold on the topic. And whenever I call a property or call a landlord, I tell them that I'm seeking multiple properties. I represent myself as either corporate housing company or furnished accommodations company. And I call this selling by analogy. Whenever you're talking to somebody who doesn't know you and may not know your space, you want to start in a comfortable space for them, in a sale, because this is a sale. So any of you who have ever been in sales knows you want your prospect to be comfortable and you want them to feel like they know everything. You want them to feel like they're in control of the sale. So I represent myself as initially as like a corporate housing company and then offer to meet them at their property, to view their property, and I, I even offer to buy them a coffee. I'm like, hey, can I buy you a coffee and meet you at your property? I've told this landlord that I, I'm looking for four or five properties in this neighborhood, but I like his specifically, and then I meet him at his property. The next step is to take the next 10 or 15 minutes to get to know that landlord. What are their specific pain points, right? Do they have to evict tenants a lot? Do tenants destroy the place and then they have to like spend a bunch of money on like rehab and then re-letting fees? Um, do the, are they not able to get a tenant without the assistance of a realtor that they have to pay a commission on? 
There's plenty of reasons why landlords have hard lives, guys. A lot of you are probably in short-term rentals because you're sick of being in long-term rentals. Is that right? Oh, some of you. Okay, cool. So at this point, you have enough ammo from a landlord to know that if you say, if you give the right value, they'll buy what you sell because they're sick of evicting people. They're sick of late rent payments. They're sick of a tenant moving out after a year and then spending two months trying to find a new one. They're sick of paying realtors commission. So when you make your presentation about your short-term rental business, as you discuss the, like the, the logistics, right? We furnish the property first. We sign a one year or longer lease, these types of details. Um, we will then market the property once it's furnished and ready to be lived in. We will market it to try to find tenants or, or like transient guests in the city. Um, some of those will stay for weeks or months or whatever your time periods are. And you talk about your business model. When you touch on points that touch his pain point, you'll say, so, so that'll mean we'll actually be doing small repairs to keep this in for sale condition. I like saying that, for sale condition. And a landlord who's sick and tired of having the dilapidated properties, their ear will perk up, perk up there. And we'll say, because we, our data says that we will be profitable on this listing, we're going to renew the lease for as long as we're profitable. So we foresee ourselves holding your property for five to 10 years. Somebody who has a lot of tenants turnover, they will go, wow, that's really great. I won't have another turnover for a while. And so your presentation doesn't have to be this big fancy pitch deck about why short-term rentals is safe, right? Your presentation will just have to softly touch on their pains. And I like keeping that conversation as casual as possible. I don't bring anything to a meeting with a landlord. I just walk in with my coffee and his coffee or her coffee, and we have a conversation. With single family homeowners, after I make my little mini presentation on how short-term rentals is very, like the sales by analogy part gets buttoned up by the, the philosophy of what we're doing is we're starting with something like corporate housing, and we tell the landlord, we do corporate housing, but it's a little bit different in these ways. And we start to compare the short-term rental industry with corporate housing by talking about the differences, but the assumption that the rest is the same. And in truth, it's really the same in, in a lot of ways. A company will sign a lease, the company will have control, the company will put somebody in that home or in that apartment, and the company is responsible for paying the rent, whether or not the person below them pays their rent. That's corporate housing in large. But now we're using like third-party marketing channels, online travel agencies to find our people too. And some corporate housing companies actually still do that. So that sales by analogy is we are more similar than we are different. And at that point, they might come and walk with you that few steps towards short-term rentals, and they might actually say yes on the spot just from that, that way of explaining it. And most of my students, their first mistake is that they go to a landlord and say, hey, I would really like to rent your property, and, and I'd like to put it on Airbnb, and they start with the, the, the most famous brand in short-term rentals, right? But also, in a way, the most infamous brand in short-term rentals, right? They're all over the news for shootings and parties and stuff. And by leading that way, just leading with short-term rentals at a landlord, like, step, like, like minute number one, they have to make a decision, not, ba not based on you, not based on how professional you are, not based on your portfolio, your experiences, not based on your empathy, your ability to show that you can make like, big decisions. Like That conversation that you have for 15 minutes tells them a lot about you. But by leading with that, hey, we, we run a short-term rental business, we'd like to Airbnb your property, they have to t tell you yes or no based on what they know about you and what they know about the industry. right? So you need to buy some time. And then after that presentation, that sales by analogy presentation, we're about 30 minutes into the conversation maybe, and I stop and say, so what questions do you have for me? And this is the key difference between the way that I pitch apartment complexes and the way that I pitch single family homeowners. Single family homeowners may not understand anything about our industry still, and especially in the Midwest. If you ask me where to go Airbnb, I tell you go into the Midwest. The money is just insane in these Midwestern cities. And a lot of landlords still don't know the industry. So, by opening up the next 10 minutes for questions, they're gonna ask you all sorts of things. They're like, wait, so how do you get your tenants? How long are they staying? How, like, how does the background check process work? What happens if there's damages? You know, what happens if you don't make enough money? How, how, how can I be certain that you're gonna make enough money to pay the rent? Stuff like that. And you'll have your objections prepared. I'm sure all of you guys have, if you were planning to do arbitrage or even co-hosting, because co-hosting has the same objections, right? A landlord's like, what happens if a guest trashes my home? Right? What if I don't make enough money to pay my, my mortgage? Right? These questions happen with co-hosting. So if you've ever studied that, you'll be armed with the same objections. And the key here is to be reassuring and to be confident and to, of course, remind them of the benefits that you discovered in the very first 10 minutes of your conversation with that landlord. After about that 10 minutes of Q&A, you can actually see their body language start to relax, usually. And this is a sign that they're coming around to the idea. And my close, how I close a landlord is this very, very little soft close, I'll say, so what's the next step? Is there an application you'd like us to fill out? And they'd go, yeah, here, let me email it to you. 
So the moment that a landlord says, yes, let me email you the application, that, all that says is we've met, we've discussed my business model, you asked a bunch of questions, you feel confident enough to let me fill out the application, you're in. Now, of course, you'll need to get it in writing. We use an addendum. A lot of people ask, do you like use your own lease? And because this is a sale, my advice for you is, don't use your own lease. Try to keep the landlord as comfortable as possible. So when they offer to give me the application, in return, what I say is for your convenience, I've got an addendum for your lease. I don't want to replace your lease. I want you to use the one you're comfortable with, but I've got a one-page addendum that will strike through only the language that prevents us from running the business. So let me email that to you for your review. If you want to change anything, let me know. So the philosophy of this whole sale, right, because this, this was a sales call, right, guys? The philosophy of this whole sale was use something that they feel safe with, corporate housing, furnished accommodations, to meet them, meet them in person, get close to them, get to know them, ask real questions. Then make your presentation, but form your presentation around their pain points. Then open up the, the, like the floor for, for questions. Don't go for the kill right away, because the landlord, they might not know enough to feel confident. And the, the prospect needs to feel like they know everything to confidently make a big decision like this. So after 10 minutes of Q&A, you'll, you'll feel it in their body language if they feel like they're getting comfortable with the concept, and then do that soft close, right? And this will get you an application with a single family homeowner. And this one little training step that I gave you right here is what people have paid me for for the last three years, in part. They also paid for my multifamily pitch, but we've had thousands of people who, who have lived like, you know, like lives like mine when I grew up. I grew up on welfare, right? So um, I worked at a Burger King and then like a pancake house. You know, I, people like that, thousands of people like that have picked up their first property using this script. It is designed for someone who doesn't really have anything to show. That pitch wasn't a pitch deck with their back data. That pitch wasn't a pitch with like how cool they were. The, the pitch doesn't say the word I in it if you do it well. It has nothing to do with you, it has to do with your company. Um, I actually have a few students here, I don't wanna make them stand up or anything, but it's been super cool to talk to, like those of you who've even learned for free on YouTube, it's super cool to talk to you guys and hear your stories. STR Insights even gave me a nod. He's like, I got an Airbnb, I think, because of one of your videos, which is actually kind of cool. And now if I have to pay STR Insights, I might actually ask for like a free membership. You know, just because it's fair, so. I mean, if I give you free videos, then you should give me free insights, right? This is trade. This is really fun. I, I, I need coffee. I actually, I think this is my only addiction in life is caffeine, or um, sharing my opinion, probably, as you can tell. So. so for multifamily, this is where it gets really fun. You can do almost the same type of pitch, but you don't stop for questions, right? And the reason why is because you're not gonna talk to the decision maker when you walk in the front door of an apartment complex. There is a caveat, I have a director of real estate, now that I work zero hours a week, I'm not the one doing these pitches anymore, and my director of real estate lives in Seattle. And he does outbound calls to investment funds, to syndicators, to big buildings, to Graystar, to Lincoln, like all these people and he's trying to sell the doors, like just like direct, real hard line. So he doesn't follow the strategy, but it's because we're like taking 40 doors at a time now. But if you walked into an apartment complex and wanted to pick up five, this is how it would work. So you'd first call the building and say, hi, I own a corporate housing company. I just want to make sure that your building can do corporate applications or that an LLC can hold a lease at your property. This is just to save you time. If you drove to every single building in your city to try to pitch that apartment complex and they can't even process an application with an LLC on it, you're wasting your time. They don't have the ability to process you on the front end. You'd have to go in the back. So you make a short list of buildings that you like that could process your LLC's application and then you go do some walkthroughs. The key is to let the leasing agent try to sell you the building. There's gonna be a salesperson that greets you and shows you the pool, shows you the gym, stuff like that. And at that point, um, they're gonna ask you about yourself eventually, right? They're gonna like, so where are you from or whatever? And that's when you start talking about your business. Be like, well, actually, I'm from Dallas. We're here because we're looking for about five or so apartments. I own a corporate housing company. Um, it, it operates a little bit differently, though. And then what I, like, you just segue into the same pitch, right? Instead of us having one customer for four months, uh, what we do is we actually sign long-term leases, a year or longer, and then we furnish the home first, and then we market the property to find tenants or transient guests to stay here. And the cool thing about this business model is it reduces our costs. So we, we can, we can like outfox our competitors, and we will hold this lease for multiple years and just change out our tenants or our guests as needed. Um, so people can stay by the week, they can stay by the month, um, and you know, we'll, we'll be able to operate you know, at scale with you guys, maybe even pick up 10, 20 or something doors. And then at this point, to get to the decision maker of the building, you'll say, so with that said, we would like to sign two year or three year long leases if possible. Who here at the building would we need to talk to 
about lease length. And they'll usually push you to the property manager or business manager. You'll probably repeat yourself the whole we're a corporate housing company, but different thing. You'll repeat it to them. And you'll talk about the number of doors you want. And so many people are apprehensive at this point because of the fear of rejection. Who here has ever had a sales job? Right? Most business owners have had a sales job. It's, like, it's, it's like almost like a rite of passage to get here. So if you've been in sales, you've been rejected, right? You've heard no. You've probably even heard a really angry or judgmental no before, right? One that just really burned your soul. You're like, oh, that one hurt. Thanks. Thanks, bro. I'm going to go cry. You know? And so, so many people are afraid of this moment, the moment of rejection. They do all the planning. They do all the preparation. But they can't get in front of that person that can tell them yes or no. But what you need to know is your power in the multifamily deal. Let's imagine a building that is like freshly built, A-class, pristine property, and they're in the middle of what's called a lease-up. There's 250 doors in the property, and they currently have zero tenants because they just finished construction. The property manager gets a bonus for how fast they can get that thing full. So you show up when they're less than 5% occupied and say, hey, I'd like to take three floors of your building. And they're like, yeah, what, what do you want? Do I need to buy you something? Like, is, like what, can I take you to dinner? Like, and so you discuss your business model, very matter of fact, and you don't even have to have any fancy words or fancy pitches. You're like, I will rent three floors of your building. I want to furnish them, and I want to, I want to run them as midterm and short-term rentals. And the building will be like, well, we're completely empty, so we don't have to worry about any uh, like tenants being upset about that, and we could really use the money in this stage of the lease-up. Let's, let's play ball. Sonder, who sold public for $1.8 billion within the like, last 24 months, which is $200,000 per key, by the way, so they sold for $200,000 per lease, per key, not owned. They own none. That's a huge markup. Where they, yesterday they said corporate housing companies are selling for $30,000 per contract. They got 7x of that when they exited public. And they did it just like this. They found leased up buildings or empty buildings currently in construction, and they come up and say, we'd like multiple floors or the whole building. And the moment you're talking about scale is the moment they forget everything they've ever told anybody else. One of the main things that people tell me is that buildings tell them, oh, we don't do Airbnb when they call, but they call and they ask for one door. And that's really the big problem. You call as a person asking for one door to do Airbnb, but if you call as a business asking for a floor or for 10 doors to do short-term rentals, they will now check, they'll do an integrity check with their boss. They're like, hey, do we need the money? Like, should we do this? Let's go. And so most of my leases on my lease, like on my scale up to 100 plus doors was that kind of deal. And then as soon as you get one property management company, usually your first one will be a mid-sized company. You may not get a gray star right away, but you get like an S2 residential, or you'll get a Baron, or you'll get, um, I actually, finger companies actually gave me one of my first leases way back in the day. Um, and there was another one, the broad, the, this group that had all the Broadstones like five years ago, and they were doing a lot of ball with me. And that's actually how I scaled a bunch. The Broadstone management saw that we would be willing to pick up leases almost anywhere in Houston and Dallas, and they started calling us, asking us to take, take doors. They started just, hey, can you take them here? Can you take them here? Every new build they did in Houston or Dallas, I got a phone call, right? It's that one relationship with the property management company, and when you deliver, they'll, they'll scale with you because as long as you don't, like, betray the, the, like, the charter of their, like, community policies, as long as you care about their building and make sure that the rest of the tenants of the building are happy, they will grow with you. Haley is the best at this. Haley will show up at every leasing office every week, bring snacks and coffee and stuff like that, and make sure the leasing staff love her. And then when the manager moves from one property to another, they call Haley and say, hey, I just moved to a new property. Would you like 20 doors at this new property? And that's how we scale. You can hire an outbound sales guy to continue to grow aggressively, or you can just focus on what we would call key accounts, accounts that matter to you that you want to keep happy. And when your lease renewal come up, they'll give you a lease renewal. We have over 90% lease renewal. And that's another thing that people are afraid of. Right? Why would I do arbitrage when the landlord's just going to cancel my lease a, 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 like a year later? And the reason why people think like this is because they're always thinking of the potential negatives and the potential risks. A lot of people really do think that running a short-term rental business is a burden on a landlord. Like a lot of people really do think that that's true. But Haley has proved that it isn't. And we get over 90% lease renewal and managers, when they move buildings, they give her new leases. So um, I'm writing a book called The Lease Loop. That's what that whole infinity thing is. And my argument in this book is that leases are actually a form of debt, if you think about it, right? If I get you to promise me your property and control of it for three years with like almost no money up front, right? Where the life of the lease, let's say the life of the lease is $75,000, right? You're giving me $75,000 worth of control, right? Because when we sign that lease, I have the rights. You're giving me $75,000 of control for what, $2,000 down? Isn't that how a car lease works? 
Does a car lease go on your credit score? Yeah. And when you're trying to get another car lease, do they see that you have another car lease? They do. But that doesn't work with apartments, right? If I make $10,000 a month in like, in like finance or something, and I go to a building and I apply there, and I get approved, and I go next door and apply there and I get approved, I go next door, I apply there and get approved, with the same $10,000 in my bank account, I can apply and get 1,000 doors with the same $10,000 of income because there is no regulatory system in the middle. Nobody's cross-checking anything. Graystar doesn't even check if you have other leases at Graystar. It's so wild. So leases are like this, like this final frontier of unregulated debt in a way, right? If you can get a landlord to give you a lease with two, two months of rent up front for free, if I paid him the first month of rent and then he gave me two months of rent for free, I basically have three months of cash flow and then control for the rest of the property for however long that lease is, and I didn't have to put really any money down. That is, if you guys love risk, if you want to like ride the lightning, then do some leases. Sign like a thousand leases today and worry about the furniture tomorrow, right? <laughs> That's where it could really get bad. So imagine, like actually, COVID in a way was a lot like the real estate bubble of 2008, where Stay Alfred had 2,700 leases and they couldn't service their debts and they went out of business because they got too greedy. So there is a dark side to using leases to grow. You could just grow, 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 and grow because it is debt that you don't have to pay yet. You're like, this is cool, I love credit cards. And then, then the rent comes due and nobody's traveling. That could happen. But as a point of diversification, if you guys are doing co-hosting and you own your properties, you guys have a more sturdy cost basis. Right? Co-hosting is great because you don't have a rent roll. Right? If the property made 1000 bucks instead of 10000 bucks, you just get 25% of 1000 So you won't ever lose money with co-hosting. Way cool. If you own the property, your cost basis could be lower or almost non-existent if the home is paid off. So all the arbitrage kids around you, all the renters, now they're scrapping to try to stay alive where you're okay. Because even if you made $3,000 or $4,000 less for a while, your cost basis is lower and you're not gonna starve when everybody else might. So as a point of diversification, leases are great to scale in a good market or in an uncertain market. Because in order to get two months of rent for free or three months of rent for free, you don't have to just do a lease up building like the example I gave you. You could go to a B-class property where I, I know a lot of syndicators, there's a few here, that specialize in B-class, right? You'll buy a B-class property and then you'll, re, like you'll, you'll put paint on it and do cool things and you'll try to get it valued at a higher price point and then you try to get it filled up too. If you buy a B-class property with 60% occupancy, jam it to 90% occupancy and sell it, you're obviously able to sell it for more, right? And so when you find a building like a B-class property that's been recently taken over by new management, you tell them that you're willing to take 20 doors of their property, they'll play ball because they need the leases. They're under the gun. This company called S2 Residential called me one day. He's like, can you take 20 doors at this property by the end of the month? And it was like April 19th. I'm like, I don't think I could sign 20 leases by, in 10 days. We can't get the furniture in time. So, but that's how much pressure sometimes these B-class property management companies are under. And so when the landlord is in a pinch or when the, real, like the property management company is in a pinch, when they are distressed, you can go save the day and give them occupancy. Your rent check is suddenly gold because landlords can get to a position where they'll take rent from anybody at one point, right? Imagine having a home empty for five or six months, right? I live at a, a building called the Katy in Dallas and the only penthouses that get rented are the ones that can see the city. So the penthouse that, that's across from me that faces away from the city, it's been empty almost my entire lease because nobody wants it at the price point that they sell it at. And at, at some point, they're going to break, right? At some point, they're going to break. They're going to give away four months of rent for free or they're going to drop the rent by $3,000 a month or something. They're going to break eventually. But that, if that was your only property, imagine that was the only thing you owned and it had no rent coming in. You would be so scared, right? Like, I made a huge mistake buying this property. And then the white knight of Airbnb arbitrage comes up and says, hey, I'll rent this for three years. You're like, please, yeah, get this, out of, get this off my list. Get this out of my face. And then they will love you to death. So you can get two months or three months of rent for free, not just because the building's leased up, but you can find landlords who are in a certain transitionary spot that they are open-minded to that idea. And when you dollar cost average two months of rent for free across a three-year lease, that is actually pretty cheap compared to trying to get two months of rent for free on a one-year lease. So at the point that we're trying to get free rent from a landlord, we're doing it once we introduce the concept of a multi-year lease because that puts them in new territory. And at the moment they're in new territory, they'll say yes to the weirdest things, right? Including free rent. So that book, The Lease Loop, will talk about my whole, like the exit, how I've played the numbers out. Um, it won't be published for a while. I'm only half done writing the book. Um, I've actually written two books and my publisher is yet to publish them. So. 
It's coming soon. You'll have three books by Sean. And so the, the, the cool thing about Airbnb, the, the part that really got me like, in this was the beating the algorithm part of Airbnb. Right? Airbnb really gamified our SEO ranking. So much so that Verbo actually has now developed a, an AI that they've alluded to, because I talked to them on occasion, they've alluded to that they have a ranking system that they want me to talk about on YouTube soon. So they're building out some form of gamification, because what that's done is that's given Airbnb almost like this kind of priority over the other platforms, because you need to make sure that Airbnb's happy in the algorithm to keep your ranking, where we all think that Verbo will just like always list our property as is. And so the big aspects of like performing really well, like top 1% on Airbnb, um, would be, of course, how you design your listing, and that comes from design, so it's really cool that they did this de design panel, because you need good photos, but you need captivating photos that contrast your competition. For example, if all the photos on your Airbnb search, the furniture was like blue and white and brown, right? There's a little thumbnail as you scroll on the maps on the one side. If on that left banner, all the photos were white, blue, and brown, but yours was like yellow and black, like the photo that they showed of the bedroom, you would have contrast with your competition that would click on you. There's four things that, that Airbnb uses in their interest algorithm. One is views. So just because your listing had a different photo than everybody else, the curiosity came in and they clicked on your listing. That's going to increase your ranking. Another one that's kind of fun is hang time. They, want, they actually track how long a person hangs out on your, web, on, on your, on your uh, listing. So they, they, it's in a way like Google tracks bounce rate, right? So they want to see that people are hanging out on your listing. They want to see you engaging with the listing. Then they care about occupancy percentage. Uh, that's a big one. Um, so Airbnb's life cycle for these big four is they'll give you a month boost because they need the data from your listing. So they just boost you. Any listing you make, there's like 30 days, we're going to give you a boost because we don't know if your listing is interesting or not. And then they're looking for indicators that make them think that your listing is interesting. So the number of views that you're getting, how many bookings you're getting, what your pace is and what your occupancy percentage is, there's that. They're looking at um, the hang time on your listing. Um, and then they start looking at your trailing data for the interest algorithm. And the tra trailing data is what's permanent. Oh, the, actually, there's another thing. It's the wish listing. Um, who here is in wish list groups? We're like, hey, wish list me. All right. I have bad news for you. If everybody already wish lists your property, you won't be able to pull that parachute again because views, bookings, hang time, and wish lists are impermanent um, indicators on their algorithm. They go away over time. It's like if I push a shopping cart, right? I gave it some momentum, and the shopping cart will slow down if there's no more momentum, right? So these are momentum indicators. So you should not be in a wish list group or use it until you think that you're suffering some form of negative Airbnb SEO situation, right? Because if you jam a bunch of wish list, wish list likes, it'll push you up in the algorithm, but only temporarily. So save that in your back pocket. Don't use it until you need it. But the rest of those indicators are permanent, like your reviews, uh, whether or not you have resolutions with people or people have like, claimed that you've done stuff wrong. Um, and of course, your trailing occupancy and what your response time with your guests are, stuff like that, all of your, at your KPIs, those are permanent. So Airbnb's algorithm is boost for 30 days, then momentum-based indicators until your listing gets old enough that your trailing data starts to matter more than the momentum indicators. And that's why you see some OG listings on Airbnb that have just, they, they've been at the top forever, right? Every time you search, like, there's, there's, there's Granny. Granny's been here for 12 years. She's always going to be number one. And we are at risk that that might change. Airbnb has changed their, like, their platform, and I think this is one thing people want to know, is what should we do about the change of Airbnb's front, like, front, front platform layout? And I don't really think there's really much to do, because if you think about it, um, who here has been hosting for more than three years? All right. Now, you have a consumer base, right? If you've been around for a while, so have the customers. Now, 98%, 99% of all the customers in the short-term rental space, they have a use case. They, they use Verbo, they use Airbnb, they use it when they travel exactly one way. They've developed a habit. Airbnb, what they've done is they've changed their landing page to try to influence people's first impressions and how they behave when they land and don't know what to do on Airbnb. Because when you load the Airbnb platform and you know what to do, you don't even care. You start looking for like Nashville, Dallas, Chicago, you go and do your thing, right? It's like using Google, we all use Google our own way. So once you've developed a habit, you're insulated. So any of you that are servicing a customer base right now should not be afraid of the change. You shouldn't be, because you will still be servicing the same customers who habitually will travel to your city and have that habit in place. But Airbnb is doing this, I think, because Verbo has taken so much of their lunch lately that they need to differentiate again. They're looking for a new, fresh way to brand and say, hey, just have a unique stay. Because Airbnb's first brand was stay with the host. 
stay with a local. That was their big first thing. And people wanted to stay with a local and have a conversation with the super host. And that's kind of gone to the side now. So now their next big brand campaign is unique spaces, unique experiences. And so, but the reason why is because Verbo is doing so amazingly well at like, breaking into the space. 50% of my calendar on all my 120 listings are Verbo bookings right now, 50%. And I do mostly apartments. And before, Verbo was just something you would use uh, for, um, for like houses and vacation rentals. But at this point now, even with apartments, I'm getting 50%. So if you want to succeed, go multi-platform um, because the, the money's really there. Um, at this point, I have a few things I would talk about, but some of the questions that you all have asked have been really, really, like, I think helpful to the community, and I would like you guys to be able to publicly ask some of your harder questions so I can just answer them for you. So any of, any of you who have arbitrage-related questions, the floor is yours. Do we have the cube? Who has a question? Big fan, Sean. Thank you for everything. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for companies like Graystar, I know that they have a strong gatekeeper. Like, I think mm. something like where you need to you need to be on their list for four years or something like that, like a waiting list, something similar. How do you get past a Graystar gatekeeper? Um, so Graystar is so big that they're no longer able to manage all of their people. They've become actually surprisingly clicky. Um, so there is a national um, application you can do to be a short-term rental vendor nationally, but that does take a process, that takes some time. But when we go to a new Graystar building, we'll talk to the property management company or the property manager um, and go through our same pitch. And what we'll discover is that there are regionals that allow Airbnb, just kind of like do what you want. And then there's property managers that allow Airbnb under that regional, and then we start doing business. And Graystar will move into a property and take over a property that we run in, and depending on that region, they may like us or they may not like us. But we've had a lot of run-ins with Graystar where we still just come in right through the front door. We treat it the same exact way. You just have to understand that since Graystar is so big, you'll have some purists in the company that are like, we don't do short-term rentals, and you'll have some functional like, we need to get this place full. So it's, it's going to be hit or miss, but there's, there's no golden bullet for Graystar, but it's actually great that they're that big because slightly smaller companies like Lincoln, they went through a few years where they wouldn't do any business because uh, like a real corporate housing company like defaulted on like a quarter million dollars of rent uh, in Dallas, and Dallas just shut down. But Graystar is so big that they, they very rarely do stuff like that. Right here. Hey, Sean, so not necessarily rental arbitrage related. You mentioned like 50% of your bookings were coming from Verbo. It's wild. I, try as I might, I've, like last year, I think I did half a million in revenue on Airbnb and literally $4,000 on Verbo. Mm -hmm. I've never gotten more than 10, 12% despite, you know, calls, fast mm -hmm. start, all that fun stuff. Is there anything in particular you're doing to boost it's, that? It's come just in the last three months. Okay. Right? So we did see a slowdown in May um, on Airbnb. We saw a legitimate slowdown in May, um, but then because of our, we do, we do dynamic pricing and I do like nerd level dynamic pricing. Who here has seen one of my pricing strategy videos, right? You know how nerdy I am, all right? And so we get granular with it. And so Verbo started picking up the slack where Airbnb wasn't. So I think what's happening is some, a lot of guests are traveling into Verbo because they're hoping for a new experience. They got mad at Airbnb. The guests got mad at Airbnb and now they're going to Verbo <clears throat> to spend their money there, hoping to run into new hosts. But here we are, right? <laughs> so, um, dynamic pricing, and a lot of people don't dynamically price with Verbo. A lot of people don't. Um, so you do need to give love to your calendar and your pricing strategy on Verbo, and that alone should start to give you more bookings. I will say that as Verbo is breaking into the market, I can't promise that because they do have a they do have a larger presence in other some cities, and as they grow, you will probably get more even density. So you might be just in a city that Verbo doesn't really jam yet, but Dallas, Houston, Austin, Philly, those four cities, like yeah. Verbo's picking it up. Great question. Right here? Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Um, so the part I'm the worst about with all of this is the numbers part, and that's the most important part, really. Sure. And uh, so I know i got to get that down. Um, but this is really intriguing to me. And so if I could just kind of recap. So, like, create an LLC for, like, a corporate mm -hmm. uh, rental company. And, um, and then, like, I like to watch the crane watch. I live here. And um, I remember one time a couple years ago, I pulled it up and there were 160 apartment buildings being built. Like, not, I mean, it's ridiculous. That's a lot. But this is how we could use it to our advantage, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're saying like to go to these new ones and then be like, hey, I can get three floors or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so where would, where's, how do you learn the numbers? <laughs> so the way that I do my market research for properties 
is I will look for identical competition, except ones that are slightly worse than me. Right? So I'll go on Airbnb and I'll look in a neighborhood, and if I'm picking up studio apartments or one bedrooms, I'll look for multiple studio apartments or one bedrooms on Airbnb that have a lot of reviews, and then I open the calendar and see if they have bookings. So like they have a lot of reviews, they're still doing business, then I'll look at their nightly rates, their weekdays, their weekends, I'll search for a week, I'll search for a month on their calendar, and I'll start taking detailed notes of that listing and their pricing strategy, do they have a two-day minimum, do they have a three-day minimum, how's their photos, how are their reviews? I'll do a competitor analysis one, one listing at a time. I'm looking for listings that I go, hey, I could beat that guy, and then I wanna know how much money they make. So if you can find like a few listings that make $3,500 a month, but you know you can do better than them because they don't have a good coffee station with decaf and tea, they don't have Disney Plus on the TV, just different stuff like that, then that's a sign that they're not doing everything right and you can beat them and that'll show you the floor, right? Because you, you can reverse, you re reverse engineer on Airbnb what people are making by looking at their full calendar and knowing what their nightly rates are by just going through the calendar. So the furnishing part, we've done it so long that we stopped, like, actually I was talking about this last night with somebody, we stopped looking at the, the finite numbers. Once you have 120 doors and you're doing 30 or 40 deals at a time, we start averaging our numbers. We on average spend $4,500 in a studio. We on average spend $5,500 on, on a one bedroom. We on average spend $2,000 more per bedroom after that. Um, our, our electricities, we run averages on uh, per bedroom size and stuff like that. And it's almost like controls where there's the white nicks and then you get to the red line. And as long as our expenses are below the red line, we don't even really look at them anymore. So um, I, would, I would say, like you say, cost per square foot doesn't matter. It's a budget, mm -hmm. right? 100%. You set your furnishing budget based on how you want to enter the market. If you're going to do luxury, you probably spend $7,500 on a one bedroom. But if you're going to do like a more economic middle, middle of the road, you do $5,500 on a one bedroom. Great. Sorry. Hey, Sean. Super fun. Thank you. Um, I want to know, um, when, you're, when you're talking to the landlords, mm -hmm. do you run into those who are concerned about potential you know, exposure to legal liability? And if so, how do you overcome that? You know, we've had a master lease we did with CIM, property management company in Dallas, and we had to get a, uh, like a $3 million uh, insurance policy for the 40 apartments we took from them. So we did 40 apartments at three buildings, and they made us get a, a, like a, a commercial liability policy. And at that size, I was willing to write that check. Hey there. Um, we have two arbitrage properties in Charlotte, and we are uh, looking to get into a group where they're investors, and we want to offer that as a, as a product. So where is that line where you figure out how much you can make and then how much you can offer as a lease to be super attractive to the investor and uh, but still don't commit to too much <clears throat> excuse me that's kind of a little bit what I'm afraid of is to, to commit yeah. to a too high of a lease mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I have this obligation so what you're gonna do is you're never gonna pay more you will never pay more on a lease than a, no a normal person make that your dogma right in arbitrage, you'll pay market rent or less. You will get free rent or you won't sign the deal, right? Because at the moment that you're paying more money than other market rents, let's say the market turns around and you have to switch to multi-month, monthly. If you're more expensive than the, the house next to you, how are you gonna like, rent it out by the month without losing money, right? So if you're gonna do arbitrage, be patient, advertise yourself well, and only find the deals where the landlord needs you and respects that they need you. Uh, Mike Stone, where are you? What's up, my man? So, Mike, he was not one of my first students, but you've been around a while. His very first deal in, um, in Arizona, he's like, this landlord said yes, but he wants an extra 300 a month, 300 month. I'm like, run, don't do it. And he's like, come on, come on, it's my first deal, let me have it. I'm like, dude, don't do it, right? So now you've got four units at a property where the landlord loves you, nine, you're up to nine. So he's up to nine now, so I, I, I need to keep better track of my people, sorry. Um, <laughs> that's great, by the way, good job. And so now you've, you've listened to that advice, right? Um, how many weeks of rent are you getting for free on your leases? Uh, I ended up getting a couple of months. It, it went weird. It was like a second to the So two months of rent for free, and some of it was because they screwed something up? Right. Wrench on them, right? So in a way, you could look at getting free rent as an adversarial relationship with the landlord, but it's just a matter-of-fact situation. There, there are payday loan places on almost every corner because poor people need money, right? It's kind of sad, it's kind of predatory. Look at it the same way, but 
you are solving their long-term problem by giving them a lease today. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, right? So if I can guarantee that your rent payments start three months from now for the next three years, sign this lease. If you want to go the next three months in the winter wondering if you're going to get a tenant January, February, March, right? Like let's say you're in Philadelphia, Chicago, and you're, it's October as, you're, as a landlord, and you don't have a lease for November, that, that's not a good place to be in when it starts snowing, right? So a landlord in the winter of Chicago, circumstantially, will give you two months of rent for free just because it's the winter. So don't look at how much you can make as a reason to pay more in rent, but prospect for landlords that truly need you, and mm. you'll pocket an extra $5,000 of profit per lease, right? And that's good. Awesome. We got 90 seconds, so we right. got to make this one quick. Hey, Sean. Thanks for the presentation. That was great. So I have a question. How do you know when too many units, it's too many in a building? Like, let's say furniture is not an issue, none of that time. How do you know for occupancy reasons where 10 units might be good, mm. but 20 might be too many? I would probably look at population of the city um, as a starting point. Uh, how many hotels do you guys think are in the four block radius of this place? Hotels yeah. within four blocks of here? Yeah, dare we count how many keys, how many total doors are here, right? Pro I, I would guess at least 4,000 within a four block walk of here. So if you're worried about 10 doors cannibalizing each other, you guys don't know the hotel industry, right? right? You could pick up, okay, in my building, uh, the Guild is a competitor of mine. They have two floors of the place that I live at, the Katy. They've got 40 doors. They're not cannibalizing themselves on their 40 doors. They're right next to American Airlines Center, and they are printing money, fat money. They would take more floors if the building would give it to them. So I just, you'll, your indicators will tell you if you're, like if you're starting to cannibalize yourself, you'll probably see it in your calendar, but I would actually just ride the lightning until you get to that mass. And I don't think you can get there. You can't get there south of 200 doors in a city. I don't think you can get there, unless you're like in a very small town, right? And that's why I would look at population of the city. Awesome. Everybody, give it up for Sean. Thank you, guys. Hey, guys. Thanks again. I'll see you at the next STR Wealth. And also, if you want to work with me directly and with my coaching team, I have seven coaches in my program, Cracking Super Host, where we all coach every week. If you want me to help you make your Airbnb business better or to start your Airbnb business, I'll leave a link in the description and pin a comment. I'll see you in Cracking Super Host, too. Oh, yeah. And as always, guys, I'll see you on the other side.